chapter six of the may flower and miscellaneous writings of harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter six aunt mary since sketching character is the mode i too take up my pencil not to make you laugh though peradventure it may be to get you to sleep i am now a tolerably old gentleman an old bachelor moreover and what is more to the point an unpretending and sober-minded one lest however any of the ladies should take exceptions against me in the very outset i will merely remark en passant that a man can sometimes become an old bachelor because he has too much heart as well as too little years ago before any of my readers were born i was a little good-for-naught of a boy of precisely that unlucky kind who are always in everybody's way and always in mischief i had to watch over my uprearing a father and mother and a whole army of older brothers and sisters my relatives bore a very great resemblance to other human beings neither good angels nor the opposite class but as mathematicians say in the mean proportion as i have before insinuated i was a sort of family scapegrace among them and one on whose head all the domestic trespasses were regularly visited either by real actual desert or by imputation for this order of things there was i confess a very solid and serious foundation in the constitution of my mind whether i was born under some cross-eyed planet or whether i was fairy smitten in my cradle certain it is that i was from the dawn of existence a sort of murad the unlucky an out of time out of place out of form sort of a boy with whom nothing prospered who always left open doors in cold weather it was henry who was sure to upset his coffee-cup at breakfast or to knock over his tumbler at dinner or to prostrate salt-cellar pepper-box and mustard-pot if he only happened to move his arm why henry who was plate-breaker general for the family it was henry who tangled mamma's silks and cottons and tore up the last newspaper for papa or threw down old phoebe's clothes horse with all her clean ironing thereupon why henry now all this was no malice prepense in me for i solemnly believed that i was the best-natured boy in the world but something was the matter with the attraction of cohesion or the attraction of gravitation with the general dispensation of matter around me that let me do what i would things would fall down and break or be torn and damaged if i only came near them and my unluckiness in any matter seemed in exact proportion to my carefulness if anybody in the room with me had a headache or any kind of nervous irritability which made it particularly necessary for others to be quiet and if i was in an especial desire unto the same i was sure while stepping around on tiptoe to fall headlong over a chair which would give an introductory push to the shovel which would fall upon the tongs which would animate the poker and all together would set in action two or three sticks of wood and down they would come together with just that hearty sociable sort of racket which showed that they were disposed to make as much of the opportunity as possible in the same manner everything that came into my hand or was at all connected with me was sure to lose by it if i rejoiced in a clean apron in the morning i was sure to make a full-length prostration thereupon on my way to school and come home nothing better but rather worse if i was sent on an errand i was sure either to lose my money in going or my purchases in returning and on these occasions my mother would often comfort me with the reflection that it was well that my ears were fastened to my head or i should lose them too of course i was a fair mark for the exhortatory powers 
not only of my parents but of all my aunts uncles and cousins to the third and fourth generation who ceased not to reprove rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine all this would have been very well if nature had not gifted me with a very unnecessary and uncomfortable capacity of feeling which like a refined ear for music is undesirable because in this world one meets with discord ninety-nine times where it meets with harmony once much therefore as i furnished occasion to be scolded at i never became used to scolding so that i was just as much galled by it the forty-first time as the first there was no such thing as philosophy in me i had just that unreasonable heart which is not conformed unto the nature of things neither indeed can be i was timid and shrinking and proud i was nothing to any one around me but an awkward unlucky boy nothing to my parents but one of half a dozen children whose faces were to be washed and stockings mended on saturday afternoon if i was very sick i had medicine and the doctor if i was a little sick i was exhorted unto patience and if i was sick at heart i was left to prescribe for myself now all this was very well what should a child need but meat and drink and room to play and a school to teach him reading and writing and somebody to take care of him when sick certainly nothing but the feelings of grown-up children exist in the mind of little ones oftener than is supposed and i had even at this early day the same keen sense of all that touched the heart wrong the same longing for something which should touch it aright the same discontent with latent matter-of-course affection and the same craving for sympathy which has been the unprofitable fashion of this world in all ages and no human being possessing such constitutionals has a better chance of being made unhappy by them than the backward uninteresting wrong-doing child we can all sympathize to some extent with men and women but how few can go back to the sympathies of childhood can understand the desolate insignificance of not being one of the grown-up people of being sent to bed to be out of the way in the evening and to school to be out of the way in the morning of manifold similar grievances and distresses which the child has no elocution to set forth and the grown person no imagination to conceive when i was seven years old i was told one morning with considerable domestic acclamation that aunt mary was coming to make us a visit and so when the carriage that brought her stopped at our door i pulled off my dirty apron and ran in among the crowd of brothers and sisters to see what was coming i shall not describe her first appearance for as i think of her i begin to grow somewhat sentimental in spite of my spectacles and might perhaps talk a little nonsense perhaps every man whether married or unmarried who has lived to the age of fifty or thereabouts has seen some woman who in his mind is the woman in distinction from all others she may not have been a relative she may not have been a wife she may simply have shone on him from afar she may be remembered in the distance of years as a star that is set as music that is hushed as beauty and loveliness faded for ever but remembered she is with interest with fervour with enthusiasm with all that heart can feel and more than words can tell to me there has been but one such and that is she whom i describe was she beautiful you ask i also will ask you one question if an angel from heaven should dwell in human form and animate any human face would not that face be lovely it might not be beautiful but would it not be lovely she was not beautiful except after this fashion how well i remember her as she used sometimes to sit thinking with her head resting on her hand her face mild and placid with a quiet october sunshine in her blue eyes and an ever-present smile over her whole countenance i remember the sudden sweetness of look when any one spoke to her the prompt attention the quick comprehension of things before you uttered them the obliging readiness to leave for you whatever she was doing 
to those who mistake occasional pensiveness for melancholy it might seem strange to say that my aunt mary was always happy yet she was so her spirits never rose to buoyancy and never sunk to despondency i know that it is an article in the sentimental confession of faith that such a character cannot be interesting for this impression there is some ground the placidity of a medium commonplace mind is uninteresting but the placidity of a strong and well-governed one borders on the sublime mutability of emotion characterizes inferior orders of being but he who combines all interest all excitement all perfection is the same yesterday to-day and for ever and if there be anything sublime in the idea of an almighty mind in perfect peace itself and therefore at leisure to bestow all its energies on the wants of others there is at least a reflection of the same sublimity in the character of that human being who has so quieted and governed the world within that nothing is left to absorb sympathy or distract attention from those around such a woman was my aunt mary her placidity was not so much the result of temperament as of choice she had every susceptibility of suffering incident to the noblest and most delicate construction of mind but they had been so directed that instead of concentrating thought on self they had prepared her to understand and feel for others she was beyond all things else a sympathetic person and her character like the green in a landscape was less remarkable for what it was in itself than for its perfect and beautiful harmony with all the colouring and shading around it other women have had talents others have been good but no woman that ever i knew possessed goodness and talent in union with such an intuitive perception of feelings and such a faculty of instantaneous adaptation to them the most troublesome thing in this world is to be condemned to the society of a person who can never understand anything you say unless you say the whole of it making your commas and periods as you go along and the most desirable thing in the world is to live with a person who saves you all the trouble of talking by knowing just what you mean before you begin to speak something of this kind of talent i began to feel to my great relief when aunt mary came into the family i remember the very first evening as she sat by the hearth surrounded by all the family her eye glanced on me with an expression that let me know she saw me and when the clock struck eight and my mother proclaimed that it was my bedtime my countenance fell as i moved sorrowfully from the back of her rocking-chair and thought how many beautiful stories aunt mary would tell after i was gone to bed she turned towards me with such a look of real understanding such an evident insight into the case that i went into banishment with a lighter heart than ever i did before how very contrary is the obstinate estimate of the heart to the rational estimate of worldly wisdom are there not some who can remember when one word one look or even the withholding of a word has drawn their heart more to a person than all the substantial favours in the world by ordinary acceptation substantial kindness respects the necessaries of animal existence while those wants which are peculiar to mind and will exist with it for ever by equally correct classification are designated as sentimental ones the supply of which though it will excite more gratitude in fact ought not to in theory before aunt mary had lived with us a month i loved her beyond anybody in the world and a utilitarian would have been amused in ciphering out the amount of favours which produced this result it was a look a word a smile it was that she seemed pleased with my new kite that she rejoiced with me when i learned to spin a top that she alone seemed to estimate my proficiency in playing ball and marbles that she never looked at all vexed when i upset her work-box upon the floor that she received all my awkward gallantry and maladroit helpfulness as if it had been in the best taste in the world that when she was sick she insisted on letting me wait on her 
though i made my customary havoc among the pitchers and tumblers of her room and displayed through my zeal to please a more than ordinary share of insufficiency for the station she also was the only person that ever i conversed with and i used to wonder how anybody who could talk all about matters and things with grown-up persons could talk so sensibly about marbles and hoops and skates and all sorts of little boy matters and i will say by the by that the same sort of speculation has often occurred to the minds of older people in connection with her she knew the value of varied information in making a woman not a pedant but a sympathetic companionable being and such she was to almost every class of mind she had too the faculty of drawing others up to her level in conversation so that i would often find myself going on in most profound style while talking with her and would wonder when i was through whether i was really a little boy still when she had enlightened us many months the time came for her to take leave and she besought my mother to give me to her for company all the family wondered what she could find to like in henry but if she did like me it was no matter and so was the case disposed of from that time i lived with her and there are some persons who can make the word live signify much more than it commonly does and she wrought on my character all those miracles which benevolent genius can work she quieted my heart directed my feelings unfolded my mind and educated me not harshly or by force but as the blessed sunshine educates the flower into full and perfect life and when all that was mortal of her died to this world her words and deeds of unutterable love shed a twilight around her memory that will fade only in the brightness of heaven End of chapter six chapter seven of the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter seven frankness there is one kind of frankness which is the result of perfect unsuspiciousness and which requires a measure of ignorance of the world and of life this kind appeals to our generosity and tenderness there is another which is the frankness of a strong but pure mind acquainted with life clear in its discrimination and upright in its intention yet above disguise or concealment this kind excites respect the first seems to proceed simply from impulse the second from impulse and reflection united the first proceeds in a measure from ignorance the second from knowledge the first is born from an undoubting confidence in others the second from a virtuous and well-grounded reliance on oneself now if you suppose that this is the beginning of a sermon or of a fourth of july oration you are very much mistaken though i must confess it hath rather an uncertain sound i merely prefaced it to a little sketch of character which you may look at if you please though i am not sure you will like it it was said of alice h that she had the mind of a man the heart of a woman and the face of an angel a combination that all my readers will think peculiarly happy there never was a woman who was so unlike the mass of society in her modes of thinking and acting yet so generally popular but the most remarkable thing about her was her proud superiority to all disguise in thought word and deed she pleased you for she spoke out a hundred things that you would conceal and spoke them with a dignified assurance that made you wonder that you had ever hesitated to say them yourself nor did this unreserve appear like the weakness of one who could not conceal or like a determination to make war on the forms of society it was rather a calm well-guided integrity regulated by a just sense of propriety knowing when to be silent but speaking the truth when it spoke at all 
her extraordinary frankness often beguiled superficial observers into supposing themselves fully acquainted with her long before they were so as the beautiful transparency of some lakes is said to deceive the eye as to their depth yet the longer you knew her the more variety and compass of character appeared through the same transparent medium but you may just visit miss alice for half an hour to-night and judge for yourselves you may walk into this little parlour there sits miss alice on the sofa sewing a pair of lace sleeves into a satin dress in which peculiarly angelic employment she may persevere till we have finished another sketch do you see that pretty little lady with sparkling eyes elastic form and a beautiful hand and foot sitting opposite to her she is a belle the character is written in her face it sparkles from the eye it dimples in her smile it pervades the whole woman but there alice has risen and is gone to the mirror and is arranging the finest auburn hair in the world in the most tasteful manner the little lady watches every motion as comically as a kitten watches a pinball it is all in vain to deny it alice you are really anxious to look pretty this evening said she i certainly am said alice quietly ay and you hope you shall please mr a and mr b said the little accusing angel certainly i do said alice as she twisted her fingers in a beautiful curl well i would not tell of it alice if i did then you should not ask me said alice i declare alice and what do you declare i never saw such a girl as you are very likely said alice stooping to pick up a pin well for my part said the little lady i never would take any pains to make anybody like me particularly a gentleman i would said alice if they would not like me without why alice i should not think you were so fond of admiration i like to be admired very much said alice returning to the sofa and i suppose everybody else does i don't care about admiration said the little lady i would be as well satisfied that people shouldn't like me as that they should then cousin i think it's a pity we all like you so well said alice with a good-humoured smile if miss alice had penetration she never made a severe use of it but really cousin said the little lady i should not think such a girl as you would think anything about dress or admiration and all that i don't know what sort of girl you think i am said alice but for my own part i only pretend to be a common human being and am not ashamed of common human feelings if god has made us so that we love admiration why should we not honestly say so i love it you love it everybody loves it and why should not everybody say it why yes said the little lady i suppose everybody has a has a, a general love for admiration i am willing to acknowledge that i have but but you have no love for it in particular said alice i suppose you mean to say that is just the way the matter is commonly disposed of everybody is willing to acknowledge a general wish for the good opinion of others but half the world are ashamed to own it when it comes to a particular case now i have made up my mind that if it is correct in general it is correct in particular and i mean to own it both ways but somehow it seems mean said the little lady it is mean to live for it to be selfishly engrossed in it but not mean to enjoy it when it comes or even to seek it if we neglect no higher interest in doing so all that god made us to feel is dignified and pure unless we pervert it but alice i never heard any person speak out so frankly as you do almost all that is innocent and natural may be spoken out and as for that which is not innocent and natural it ought not even to be thought but can everything be spoken that may be thought said the lady no we have an instinct which teaches us to be silent sometimes but if we speak at all let it be in simplicity and sincerity now for instance alice said the lady it is very innocent and natural as you say to think this that and the other nice thing of yourself especially when everybody is telling you of it now would you speak the truth if any one asked you on this point if it were a person who had a right to ask and if it were a proper time and place i would said alice well then said the bright lady i ask you alice in this very proper time and place do you think that you are handsome 
now i suppose you expect me to make a curtsy to every chair in the room before i answer said alice but dispensing with that ceremony i will tell you fairly i think i am do you think that you are good not entirely said alice well but don't you think you are better than most people as far as i can tell i think i am better than some people but really cousin i don't trust my own judgment in this matter said alice well alice one more question do you think james martyrs likes you or me best i do not know said alice i did not ask you what you knew but what you thought said the lady you must have some thought about it well then i think he likes me best said alice just then the door opened and in walked the identical james martyrs alice blushed looked a little comical and went on with her sewing while the little lady began really mr james i wish you had come a minute sooner to hear alice's confessions what has she confessed why that she is handsomer and better than most folks that's nothing to be ashamed of said james oh that's not all she wants to look pretty and loves to be admired and all it sounds very much like her said james looking at alice oh but besides that said the lady she has been preaching a discourse in justification of vanity and self-love and next time you shall take notes when i preach said alice for i don't think your memory is remarkably happy you see james said the lady that alice makes it a point to say exactly the truth when she speaks at all and i've been puzzling her with questions i really wish you would ask her some and see what she will say but mercy there is uncle c come to take me to ride i must run and off flew the little hummingbird leaving james and alice tete-a-tete -tete. there really is one question said james clearing his voice alice looked up there is one question alice which i wish you would answer alice did not inquire what the question was but began to look very solemn and just then the door was shut and so i never knew what the question was only i observed that james martyrs seemed in some seventh heaven for a week afterwards and you can finish it for yourself lady end of chapter seven frankness Chapter 8, Part 1 of The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe chapter eight the sabbath sketches from a notebook of an elderly gentleman part one the puritan sabbath is there such a thing existing now or has it gone with the things that were to be looked at as a curiosity in the museum of the past can any one in memory take himself back to the unbroken stillness of that day and recall the sense of religious awe which seemed to brood in the very atmosphere checking the merry laugh of childhood and chaining in unwonted stillness the tongue of volatile youth and imparting even to the sunshine of heaven and the unconscious notes of animals a tone of its own gravity and repose if you cannot remember these things go back with me to the verge of early boyhood and live with me one of the sabbaths that i have spent beneath the roof of my uncle phineas fletcher imagine the long sunny hours of a saturday afternoon insensibly slipping away as we youngsters are exploring the length and breadth of a trout stream or chasing gray squirrels or building mud mill dams in the brook the sun sinks lower and lower but we still think it does not want half an hour to sundown at last he so evidently is really going down that there is no room for scepticism or latitude of opinion on the subject and with many a lingering regret we began to put away our fish-hooks and hang our hoops over our arm preparatory to trudging homeward 
oh henry don't you wish that saturday afternoons lasted longer said little john to me i do says cousin bill who was never the boy to mince matters in giving his sentiments and i wouldn't care if sunday didn't come but once a year oh bill that's wicked i'm afraid says little conscientious susan who with her doll in hand was coming home from a saturday afternoon visit can't help it says bill catching susan's bag and tossing it in the air i never did like to sit still and that's why i hate sundays hate sundays oh bill why aunt kezzy says heaven is an eternal sabbath only think of that well i know i must be pretty different from what i am now before i could sit still for ever said bill in a lower and somewhat disconcerted tone as if admitting the force of the consideration the rest of us began to look very grave and to think that we must get to liking sunday some time or other or it would be a very bad thing for us as we drew near the dwelling the compact and business-like form of aunt kezzy was seen emerging from the house to hasten our approach how often have i told you young ones not to stay out after sundown on saturday night don't you know it's the same as sunday you wicked children you come right into the house every one of you and never let me hear of such a thing again this was aunt kezzy's regular exordium every saturday night for we children being blinded as she supposed by natural depravity always made strange mistakes in reckoning time on saturday afternoons after being duly suppered and scrubbed we were enjoined to go to bed and remember that to-morrow was sunday and that we must not laugh and play in the morning with many a sorrowful look did susan deposit her doll in the chest and give one lingering glance at the patchwork she was piecing for dolly's bed while william john and myself emptied our pockets of all superfluous fish-hooks bits of twine pop-guns slices of potato marbles and all the various items of boy property which to keep us from temptation were taken into aunt kezzy's safe keeping over sunday my uncle phineas was a man of great exactness and sunday was the centre of his whole worldly and religious system everything with regard to his worldly business was so arranged that by saturday noon it seemed to come to a close of itself all his accounts were looked over his workmen paid all borrowed things returned and lent things sent after and every tool and article belonging to the farm was returned to its own place at exactly such an hour every saturday afternoon and an hour before sundown every item of preparation even to the blacking of his sunday shoes and the brushing of his sunday coat was entirely concluded and at the going down of the sun the stillness of the sabbath seemed to settle down over the whole dwelling and now it is sunday morning and though all without is fragrance and motion and beauty the dewdrops are twinkling butterflies fluttering and merry birds caroling and racketing as if they never could sing loud or fast enough yet within there is such a stillness that the tick of the tall mahogany clock is audible through the whole house and the buzz of the blue flies as they whiz along up and down the window panes is a distinct item of hearing look into the best front room and you may see the upright form of my uncle phineas in his immaculate sunday clothes with his bible spread open on the little stand before him and even a deeper than usual gravity settling down over his toil-worn features alongside in well-brushed sunday clothes with clean faces and smooth hair sat the whole of us younger people each drawn up in a chair with hat and handkerchief ready for the first stroke of the bell while aunt kezzy all trimmed and primmed and made ready for meeting sat reading her psalm-book only looking up occasionally to give an additional jerk to some shirt-collar or the fifteenth pull to susan's frock or to repress any straggling looks that might be wandering about beholding vanity 
a stranger in glancing at uncle phineas as he sat intent on his sunday reading might have seen that the sabbath was in his heart there was no mistake about it it was plain that he had put by all worldly thoughts when he shut up his account book and that his mind was as free from every earthly association as his sunday coat was from dust the slave of worldliness who is driven by perplexing business or adventurous speculation through the hours of a half-kept sabbath to the fatigues of another week might envy the unbroken quiet the sunny tranquillity which hallowed the weekly rest of my uncle the sabbath of the puritan christian was the golden day and all its associations and all its thoughts words and deeds were so entirely distinct from the ordinary material of life that it was to him a sort of weekly translation a quitting of this world to sojourn a day in a better and year after year as each sabbath set its seal on the completed labours of a week the pilgrim felt that one more stage of his earthly journey was completed and that he was one week nearer to his eternal rest and as years with their changes came on and the strong man grew old and missed one after another familiar forms that had risen around his earlier years the face of the sabbath became like that of an old and tried friend carrying him back to the scenes of his youth and connecting him with scenes long gone by restoring to him the dew and freshness of brighter and more buoyant days viewed simply as an institution for a christian and mature mind nothing could be more perfect than the puritan sabbath if it had any failing it was in the want of adaptation to children and to those not interested in its peculiar duties if you had been in the dwelling of my uncle of a sabbath morning you must have found the unbroken stillness delightful the calm and quiet must have soothed and disposed you for contemplation and the evident appearance of single-hearted devotion to the duties of the day in the elder part of the family must have been a striking addition to the picture but then if your eye had watched attentively the motions of us juveniles you might have seen that what was so very invigorating to the disciplined christian was a weariness to young flesh and bones then there was not as now the intellectual relaxation afforded by the sunday school with its various forms of religious exercise its thousand modes of interesting and useful information our whole stock in this line was the bible and primer and these were our main dependence for whiling away the tedious hours between our early breakfast and the signal for meeting how often was our invention stretched to find wherewithal to keep up our stock of excitement in a line with the duties of the day for the first half hour perhaps a story in the bible answered our purpose very well but having dispatched the history of joseph for the story of the ten plagues we then took to the primer and then there was first the looking over the system of theological and ethical teaching commencing in adam's fall we sinned all and extending through three or four pages of pictorial and poetic embellishment next was the death of john rogers who was burned at smithfield and for a while we could entertain ourselves with counting all his nine children and one at the breast as in the picture they stand in a regular row like a pair of stairs these being done came miscellaneous exercises of our own invention such as counting all the psalms in the psalm-book backward and forward to and from the doxology or numbering the books in the bible or some other such device as we deemed within the pale of religious employments when all these failed and it still wanted an hour of meeting time we looked up at the ceiling and down at the floor and all around into every corner to see what we could do next and happy was he who could spy a pin gleaming in some distant crack and forthwith muster an occasion for getting down to pick it up 
then there was the infallible recollection that we wanted a drink of water as an excuse to get out to the well or else we heard some strange noise among the chickens and insisted that it was essential that we should see what was the matter or else pussy would jump on to the table when all of us would spring to drive her down while there was a most assiduous watching of the clock to see when the first bell would ring happy was it for us in the interim if we did not begin to look at each other and make up faces or slyly slip off and on our shoes or some other incipient attempts at roguery which would gradually so undermine our gravity that there would be some sudden explosion of merriment whereat uncle phineas would look up and say tut tut and aunt kezzy would make a speech about wicked children breaking the sabbath day i remember once how my cousin bill got into deep disgrace one sunday by a roguish trick he was just about to close his bible with all sobriety when snap came a grasshopper through an open window and alighted in the middle of the page bill instantly kidnapped the intruder for so important an auxiliary in the way of employment was not to be despised presently we children looked towards bill and there he sat very demurely reading his bible with the grasshopper hanging by one leg from the corner of his mouth kicking and sprawling without in the least disturbing master william's gravity we all burst into an uproarious laugh but it came to be rather a serious affair for bill as his good father was in the practice of enforcing truth and duty by certain modes of moral suasion much recommended by solomon though fallen into disrepute at the present day this morning picture may give a good specimen of the whole livelong sunday which presented only an alternation of similar scenes until sunset when a universal unchaining of tongues and a general scamper proclaimed that the sun was down but it may be asked what was the result of all this strictness did it not disgust you with the sabbath and with religion no it did not it did not because it was the result of no unkindly feeling but of consistent principle and consistency of principle is what even children learn to appreciate and revere the law of obedience and of reverence for the sabbath was constraining so equally on the young and the old that its claims came to be regarded like those immutable laws of nature which no one thinks of being out of patience with though they sometimes bear hard on personal convenience the effect of the system was to ingrain into our character a veneration for the sabbath which no friction of after life would ever efface i have lived to wander in many climates and foreign lands where the sabbath is an unknown name or where it is only recognized by noisy mirth but never has the day returned without bringing with it a breathing of religious awe and even a yearning for the unbroken stillness the placid repose and the simple devotion of the puritan sabbath another scene how late we are this morning said mrs roberts to her husband glancing hurriedly at the clock as they were sitting down to breakfast on a sabbath morning really it is a shame to us to be so late sundays i wonder john and henry are not up yet hannah did you speak to them yes ma'am but i could not make them mind they said it was sunday and that we always have breakfast later sundays well it is a shame to us i must say said mrs roberts sitting down to the table i never lie late myself unless something in particular happens last night i was out very late and sabbath before last i had a bad headache well well my dear said mr roberts it is not worth while to worry yourself about it sunday is a day of rest everybody indulges a little of a sunday morning it is so very natural you know one's work done up one feels like taking a little rest well i must say it was not the way my mother brought me up said mrs roberts and i really can't feel it to be right 
this last part of the discourse had been listened to by two sleepy-looking boys who had meanwhile taken their seats at table with that listless air which is the result of late sleeping oh by the by my dear what did you give for those hams saturday said mr roberts eleven cents a pound i believe replied mrs roberts but stevens and phillips have some much nicer canvas and all for ten cents i think we had better get our things at stevens and phillips's in future my dear why are they much cheaper oh a great deal but i forget it is sunday we ought to be thinking of other things boys have you looked over your sunday school lesson no ma'am now how strange and here it wants only half an hour of the time and you are not dressed either now see the bad effects of not being up in time the boys looked sullen and said they were up as soon as any one else in the house well your father and i had some excuse because we were out late last night you ought to have been up full three hours ago and to have been all ready with your lessons learned now what do you suppose you shall do oh mother do let us stay at home this one morning we don't know the lesson and it won't do any good for us to go no indeed i shall not you must go and get along as well as you can it is all your own fault now go upstairs and hurry we shall not find time for prayers this morning the boys took themselves upstairs to hurry as directed and soon one of them called from the top of the stairs mother mother the buttons are off this vest so i can't wear it and mother here is a long rip in my best coat said another why did you not tell me of it before said mrs roberts coming upstairs i forgot it said the boy well well stand still i must catch it together somehow if it is sunday there there is the bell stand still a minute and mrs roberts plied needle and thread and scissors there that will do for to-day dear me how confused everything is to-day it is always just so sunday said john flinging up his book and catching it again as he ran downstairs it is always just so sundays these words struck rather unpleasantly on mrs roberts's conscience for something told her that whatever the reason might be it was just so on sunday everything was later and more irregular than any other day in the week hannah you must boil that piece of beef for dinner to-day i thought you told me you did not have cooking done on sunday no i do not generally i am very sorry mr roberts would get that piece of meat yesterday we did not need it but here it is on our hands the weather is too hot to keep it it won't do to let it spoil so i must have it boiled for aught i see hannah had lived four sabbaths with mrs roberts and on two of them she had been required to cook from similar reasoning for once is apt in such cases to become a phrase of very extensive signification it really worries me to have things go on so as they do on sundays said mrs roberts to her husband i never do feel as if we kept sunday as we ought my dear you have been saying so ever since we were married and i do not see what you are going to do about it for my part i do not see why we do not do as well as people in general we do not visit nor receive company nor read improper books we go to church and send the children to sunday school and so the greater part of the day is spent in a religious way then out of church we have the children's sunday school books and one or two religious newspapers i think that is quite enough but somehow when i was a child my mother said mrs roberts hesitating oh my dear your mother must not be considered an exact pattern for these days people were too strict in your mother's time they carried the thing too far altogether everybody allows it now mrs roberts was silenced but not satisfied a strict religious education had left just conscience enough on this subject to make her uneasy 
these worthy people had a sort of general idea that sunday ought to be kept and they intended to keep it but they had never taken the trouble to investigate or inquire as to the most proper way nor was it so much an object of interest that their weekly arrangements were planned with any reference to it mr roberts would often engage in business at the close of the week which he knew would so fatigue him that he would be weary and listless on sunday and mrs roberts would allow her family cares to accumulate in the same way so that she was either wearied with efforts to accomplish it before the sabbath or perplexed and worried by finding everything at loose ends on that day they had the idea that sunday was to be kept when it was perfectly convenient and did not demand any sacrifice of time or money but if stopping to keep the sabbath in a journey would risk passage money or a seat in the stage or in housekeeping if it would involve any considerable inconvenience or expense it was deemed a providential intimation that it was a work of necessity and mercy to attend to secular matters to their minds the fourth command read thus remember the sabbath day to keep it holy when it comes convenient and costs neither time nor money as to the effects of this on the children there was neither enough of strictness to make them respect the sabbath nor of religious interest to make them love it of course the little restraint there was proved just enough to lead them to dislike and despise it children soon perceived the course of their parents feelings and it was evident enough to the children of this family that their father and mother generally found themselves hurried into the sabbath with hearts and minds full of this world and their conversation and thoughts were so constantly turning to worldly things and so awkwardly drawn back by a sense of religious obligation that the sabbath appeared more obviously a clog and a fetter than it did under the strictest regime of puritan days End of chapter eight part one Chapter Eight, Part Two of the May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe chapter eight part two sabbath sketches sketch second the little quiet village of camden stands under the brow of a rugged hill in one of the most picturesque parts of new england and its regular honest and industrious villagers were not a little surprised and pleased that mr james a rich man and pleasant spoken withal had concluded to take up his residence among them he brought with him a pretty genteel wife and a group of rosy romping but amiable children and there was so much of good nature and kindness about the manners of every member of the family that the whole neighbourhood were prepossessed in their favour mr james was a man of somewhat visionary and theoretical turn of mind and very much in the habit of following out his own ideas of right and wrong without troubling himself particularly as to the appearance his course might make in the eyes of others he was a supporter of the ordinances of religion and always ready to give both time and money to promote any benevolent object and though he had never made any public profession of religion nor connected himself with any particular set of christians still he seemed to possess great reverence for god and to worship him in spirit and in truth and he professed to make the bible the guide of his life mr james had been brought up under a system of injudicious religious restraint he had determined in educating his children to adopt an exactly opposite course and to make religion and all its institutions sources of enjoyment his aim doubtless was an appropriate one but his method of carrying it out to say the least was one which was not a safe model for general imitation in regard to the sabbath for example he considered that although the plan of going to church twice a day and keeping all the family quiet within doors the rest of the time was good other methods would be much better 
accordingly after the morning service which he and his whole family regularly attended he would spend the rest of the day with his children in bad weather he would instruct them in natural history show them pictures and read them various accounts of the works of god combining all with such religious instruction and influence as a devotional mind might furnish when the weather permitted he would range with them through the fields collecting minerals and plants or sail with them on the lake meanwhile directing the thoughts of his young listeners upward to god by the many beautiful traces of his presence and agency which superior knowledge and observation enabled him to discover and point out these sunday strolls were seasons of most delightful enjoyment to the children though it was with some difficulty that their father could restrain them from loud and noisy demonstrations of delight and he saw with some regret that the mere animal excitement of the stroll seemed to draw the attention too much from religious considerations and in particular to make the exercises of the morning seem like a preparatory penance to the enjoyments of the afternoon nevertheless when mr james looked back to his own boyhood and remembered the frigid restraint the entire want of any kind of mental or bodily excitement which had made the sabbath so much a weariness to him he could not but congratulate himself when he perceived his children looking forward to sunday as a day of delight and found himself on that day continually surrounded by a circle of smiling and cheerful faces his talent of imparting religious instruction in a simple and interesting form was remarkably happy and it is probable that there was among his children an uncommon degree of real thought and feeling on religious subjects as the result the good people of camden however knew not what to think of a course that appeared to them an entire violation of all the requirements of the sabbath the first impulse of human nature is to condemn at once all who vary from what has been commonly regarded as the right way and accordingly mr james was unsparingly denounced by many good people as a sabbath-breaker an infidel and an opposer to religion such was the character heard of him by mr richards a young clergyman who shortly after mr james fixed his residence in camden accepted the pastoral charge of the village it happened that mr richards had known mr james in college and remembering him as a remarkably serious amiable and conscientious man he resolved to ascertain from himself the views which had led him to the course of conduct so offensive to the good people of the neighbourhood this is all very well my good friend said he after he had listened to mr james's eloquent account of his own system of religious instruction and its effects upon his family i do not doubt that this system does very well for yourself and family but there are other things to be taken into consideration besides personal and family improvement do you not know mr james that the most worthless and careless part of my congregation quote your example as a respectable precedent for allowing their families to violate the order of the sabbath you and your children sail about on the lake with minds and hearts i doubt not elevated and tranquillized by its quiet repose but ben dakes and his idle profane army of children consider themselves as doing very much the same thing when they lie lolling about sunning themselves on its shore or skipping stones over its surface the whole of a sunday afternoon let every one answer to his own conscience replied mr james if i keep the sabbath conscientiously i am approved of god if another transgresses his conscience to his own master he standeth or falleth i am not responsible for all the abuses that idle or evil disposed persons may fall into in consequence of my doing what is right let me quote an answer from the same chapter said mr richards let no man put a stumbling-block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way let not your good be evil spoken of it is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or made weak 
now my good friend you happen to be endowed with a certain tone of mind which enables you to carry through your mode of keeping the sabbath with little comparative evil and much good so far as your family is concerned but how many persons in this neighbourhood do you suppose would succeed equally well if they were to attempt it if it were the common custom for families to absent themselves from public worship in the afternoon and to stroll about the fields or ride or sail how many parents do you suppose would have the dexterity and talent to check all that was inconsistent with the duties of the day is it not your ready command of language your uncommon tact in simplifying and illustrating your knowledge of natural history and of biblical literature that enable you to accomplish the results that you do and is there one parent in a hundred that could do the same now just imagine our neighbour squire hart with his ten boys and girls turned out into the fields on a sunday afternoon to profit withal you know he can never finish a sentence without stopping to begin it again half a dozen times what progress would he make in instructing them and so of a dozen others i could name along this very street here now you men of cultivated minds must give your countenance to courses which would be best for society at large or as the sentiment was expressed by st paul we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves for even christ pleased not himself think my dear sir if our saviour had gone only on the principle of avoiding what might be injurious to his own improvement how unsafe his example might have proved to less elevated minds doubtless he might have made a sabbath-day fishing excursion an occasion of much elevated and impressive instruction but although he declared himself lord of the sabbath day and at liberty to suspend its obligation at his own discretion yet he never violated the received method of observing it except in cases where superstitious tradition trenched directly on those interests which the sabbath was given to promote he asserted the right to relieve pressing bodily wants and to administer to the necessities of others on the sabbath but beyond that he allowed himself in no deviation from established custom mr james looked thoughtful i have not reflected on the subject in this view he replied but my dear sir considering how little of the public services of the sabbath is on a level with the capacity of younger children it seems to me almost a pity to take them to church the whole of the day i have thought of that myself replied mr richards and have sometimes thought that could persons be found to conduct such a thing it would be desirable to institute a separate service for children in which the exercises should be particularly adapted to them i should like to be minister to a congregation of children said mr james warmly well replied mr richards give our good people time to get acquainted with you and do away the prejudices which your extraordinary mode of proceeding has induced and i think i could easily assemble such a company for you every sabbath after this much to the surprise of the village mr james and his family were regular attendants at both the services of the sabbath mr richards explained to the good people of his congregation the motives which had led their neighbour to the adoption of what to them seemed so unchristian a course and upon reflection they came to the perception of the truth that a man may depart very widely from the received standard of right for other reasons than being an infidel or an opposer of religion a ready return of cordial feeling was the result and as mr james found himself treated with respect and confidence he began to feel notwithstanding his fastidiousness that there were strong points of congeniality between all real and warm-hearted christians however different might be their intellectual culture and in all simplicity united himself with the little church of camden a year from the time of his first residence there every sabbath afternoon saw him surrounded by a congregation of young children for whose benefit he had at his own expense provided a room fitted up with maps scriptural pictures and every convenience for the illustration of biblical knowledge and the parents or guardians who from time to time attended their children during these exercises 
often confess themselves as much interested and benefited as any of their youthful companions end of chapter eight part two chapter eight part three of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter eight part three sabbath sketches sketch third it was near the close of a pleasant saturday afternoon that i drew up my weary horse in front of a neat little dwelling in the village of n this as near as i could gather from description was the house of my cousin william fletcher the identical rogue of a bill fletcher of whom we have aforetime spoken bill had always been a thriving push ahead sort of a character and during the course of my rambling life i had improved every occasional opportunity of keeping up our early acquaintance the last time that i returned to my native country after some years of absence i heard of him as married and settled in the village of n where he was conducting a very prosperous course of business and shortly after received a pressing invitation to visit him at his own home now as i had gathered from experience the fact that it is of very little use to rap one's knuckles off on the front door of a country house without any knocker i therefore made the best of my way along a little path bordered with marigolds and balsams that led to the back part of the dwelling the sound of a number of childish voices made me stop and looking through the bushes i saw the very image of my cousin bill fletcher as he used to be twenty years ago the same bold forehead the same dark eyes the same smart saucy mouth and the same who cares for that toss to his head there now exclaimed the boy setting down a pair of shoes that he had been blacking and arranging them at the head of a long row of all sizes and sorts from those which might have fitted a two-year-old foot upward there i've blacked every single one of them and made them shine too and done it all in twenty minutes if anybody thinks they can do it quicker than that i'd just like to have them try that's all i know they couldn't though said a fair-haired little girl who stood admiring the sight evidently impressed with the utmost reverence for her brother's ability and bill i've been putting up all the playthings in the big chest and i want you to come and turn the lock the key hurts my fingers Pooh i can turn it easier than that said the boy snapping his fingers have you got them all in yes all only i left out the soft bales and the string of red beads and the great rag baby for fanny to play with you know mother says babies must have their playthings sunday oh to be sure said the brother very considerately babies can't read you know as we can nor hear bible stories nor look at pictures at this moment i stepped forward for the spell of former times was so powerfully on me that i was on the very point of springing forward with a hallo there bill as i used to meet the father in old times but the look of surprise that greeted my appearance brought me to myself is your father at home said i father and mother are both gone out but i guess sir they will be home in a few moments won't you walk in i accepted the invitation and the little girl showed me into a small and very prettily furnished parlour there was a piano with music-books on one side of the room some fine pictures hung about the walls and a little neat centre-table was plentifully strewn with books besides this the two recesses on each side of the fireplace contained each a bookcase with a glass-locked door the little girl offered me a chair and then lingered a moment as if she felt some disposition to entertain me if she could only think of something to say and at last looking up in my face she said in a confidential tone mother says she left willie and me to keep house this afternoon while she was gone and we are putting up all the things for sunday so as to get everything done before she comes home willie has gone to put away the playthings and i am going to put up the books 
so saying she opened the doors of one of the bookcases and began busily carrying the books from the centre table to deposit them on the shelves in which employment she was soon assisted by willie who took the matter in hand in a very masterly manner showing his sister what were and what were not sunday books with an air of a person entirely at home in the business robinson crusoe and the many-volumed peter parley were put by without hesitation there was however a short demurring over a north american review because willie said he was sure his father read something one sunday out of one of them while susan averred that he did not commonly read in it and only read in it then because the piece was something about the bible but as nothing could be settled definitively on the point the review was laid on the table like knotty questions in congress then followed a long discussion over an extract book which as usual contained all sorts both sacred serious comic and profane and at last willie with much gravity decided to lock it up on the principle that it was best to be on the safe side in support of which he appealed to me i was saved from deciding the question by the entrance of the father and mother my old friend knew me at once and presented his pretty wife to me with the same look of exultation with which he used to hold up a string of trout or an uncommonly fine perch of his own catching for my admiration and then looking round on his fine family of children two more of which he had brought home with him seemed to say to me there what do you think of that now and in truth a very pretty sight it was enough to make any one's old bachelor coat sit very uneasily on him indeed there is nothing that gives one such a startling idea of the tricks that old father time has been playing on us as to meet some boyish or girlish companions with half a dozen or so of thriving children about them my old friend i found was in essence just what the boy had been there was the same upright bearing the same confident cheerful tone to his voice and the same fire in his eye only that the hand of manhood had slightly touched some of the lines of his face giving them a staidness of expression becoming the man and the father very well my children said mrs fletcher as after tea william and susan finished recounting to her the various matters that they had set in order that afternoon i believe now we can say that our week's work is finished and that we have nothing to do but rest and enjoy ourselves oh and papa will show us the pictures in those great books that he brought home for us last monday will he not said little robert and mother you will tell us some more about solomon's temple and his palaces won't you said susan and i should like to know if father has found out the answer to that hard question i gave him last sunday said willie all will come in good time said mrs fletcher but tell me my dear children are you sure that you are quite ready for the sabbath you say you have put away the books and the playthings have you put away too all wrong and unkind feelings do you feel kindly and pleasantly towards everybody yes mother said willie who appeared to have taken a great part of this speech to himself i went over to tom walters this very morning to ask him about that chicken of mine and he said that he did not mean to hit it and did not know he had till i told him of it and so we made all up again and i am glad i went i am inclined to think willie said his father that if everybody would make it a rule to settle up all their differences before sunday there would be very few long quarrels and lawsuits in about half the cases a quarrel is founded on some misunderstanding that would be got over in five minutes if one would go directly to the person for explanation i suppose i need not ask you said mrs fletcher whether you have fully learned your sunday-school lessons oh to be sure said william you know mother that susan and i were busy about them through monday and tuesday and then this afternoon we looked them over again and wrote down some questions and i heard robert say his all through and showed him all the places on the bible atlas said susan well then said my friend if everything is done let us begin sunday with some music 
thanks to the recent improvements in the musical instruction of the young every family can now form a domestic concert with words and tunes adapted to the capacity and the voices of children and while these little ones full of animation pressed round their mother as she sat at the piano and accompanied her music with the words of some beautiful hymns i thought that though i might have heard finer music i had never listened to any that answered the purpose of music so well it was a custom at my friends to retire at an early hour on saturday evening in order that there might be abundant time for rest and no excuse for late rising on the sabbath and accordingly when the children had done singing after a short season of family devotion we all betook ourselves to our chambers and i for one fell asleep with the impression of having finished the week most agreeably and with anticipations of very great pleasure on the morrow early in the morning i was roused from my sleep by the sound of little voices singing with great animation in the room next to mine and listening i caught the following words awake awake your bed forsake to god your praises pay the morning sun is clear and bright with joy we hail his cheerful light in songs of love praise god above it is the sabbath day the last words were repeated and prolonged most vehemently by a voice that i knew for master williams now willie i like the other one best said the soft voice of little susan and immediately she began how sweet is the day when leaving our play the saviour we seek the fair morning glows when jesus arose the best in the week master william helped along with great spirit in the singing of this tune though i heard him observing at the end of the first verse that he liked the other one better because it seemed to step off so kind a lively and his accommodating sister followed him as he began singing it again with redoubled animation it was a beautiful summer morning and the voices of the children within accorded well with the notes of birds and bleeding flocks without a cheerful yet sabbath-like and quieting sound blessed be children's music said i to myself how much better this is than the solitary tick-tick of old uncle fletcher's tall mahogany clock the family bell summoned us to the breakfast-room just as the children had finished their hymn the little breakfast parlour had been swept and garnished expressly for the day and a vase of beautiful flowers which the children had the day before collected from their gardens adorned the centre table the door of one of the bookcases by the fireplace was thrown open presenting to view a collection of prettily bound books over the top of which appeared in gilt letters the inscription sabbath library the windows were thrown open to let in the invigorating breath of the early morning and the birds that flitted among the rose bushes without seemed scarcely lighter and more buoyant than did the children as they entered the room it was legibly written on every face in the house that the happiest day in the week had arrived and each one seemed to enter into its duties with a whole soul it was still early when the breakfast and the season of family devotion were over and the children eagerly gathered round the table to get a sight of the pictures in the new books which their father had purchased in new york the week before and which had been reserved as a sunday's treat they were a beautiful edition of calmet's dictionary in several large volumes with very superior engravings it seems to me that this work must be very expensive i remarked to my friend as we were turning the leaves indeed it is so he replied but here is one place where i am less withheld by considerations of expense than in any other in all that concerns making a show in the world i am perfectly ready to economize i can do very well without expensive clothing or fashionable furniture and am willing that we should be looked on as very plain sort of people in all such matters but in all that relates to the cultivation of the mind and the improvement of the hearts of my children i am willing to go to the extent of my ability whatever will give my children a better knowledge of or deeper interest in the bible or enable them to spend a sabbath profitably and without weariness stands first on my list among things to be purchased i have spent in this way one-third as much as the furnishing of my house costs me on looking over the shelves of the sabbath library i perceived that my friend had been at no small pains in the selection it comprised all the popular standard works for the illustration of the bible together with the best of the modern religious publications adapted to the capacity of young children 
two large drawers below were filled with maps and scriptural engravings some of them of a very superior character we have been collecting these things gradually ever since we have been at housekeeping said my friend the children take an interest in this library as something more particularly belonging to them and some of the books are donations from their little earnings yes said willie i bought helen's pilgrimage with my egg money and susan bought the life of david and little robert is going to buy one too next new year but said i would not the sunday school library answer all the purpose of this the sabbath school library is an admirable thing said my friend but this does more fully and perfectly what that was intended to do it makes a sort of central attraction at home on the sabbath and makes the acquisition of religious knowledge and the proper observance of the sabbath a sort of family enterprise you know he added smiling that people always feel interested for an object in which they have invested money the sound of the first sabbath school bell put an end to this conversation the children promptly made themselves ready and as their father was the superintendent of the school and their mother one of the teachers it was quite a family party one part of every sabbath at my friend's was spent by one or both parents with the children in a sort of review of the week the attention of the little ones was directed to their own characters the various defects or improvements of the past week were pointed out and they were stimulated to be on their guard in the time to come and the whole was closed by earnest prayer for such heavenly aid as the temptations and faults of each particular one might need after church in the evening while the children were thus withdrawn to their mother's apartment i could not forbear reminding my friend of old times and of the rather anti-sabbatical turn of his mind in our boyish days now william said i do you know that you were the last boy of whom such an enterprise in sabbath-keeping as this was to have been expected i suppose you remember sunday at the old place nay now i think i was the very one said he smiling for i had sense enough to see as i grew up that the day must be kept thoroughly or not at all and i had enough blood and motion in my composition to see that something must be done to enliven and make it interesting so i set myself about it it was one of the first of our housekeeping resolutions that the sabbath should be made a pleasant day and yet be as inviolably kept as in the strictest times of our good father and we have brought things to run in that channel so long that it seems to be the natural order i have always supposed said i that it required a peculiar talent and more than common information in a parent to accomplish this to any extent it requires nothing replied my friend but common sense and a strong determination to do it parents who make a definite object of the religious instruction of their children if they have common sense can very soon see what is necessary in order to interest them and if they find themselves wanting in the requisite information they can in these days very readily acquire it the sources of religious knowledge are so numerous and so popular in their form that all can avail themselves of them the only difficulty after all is that the keeping of the sabbath and the imparting of religious instruction are not made enough of a home object parents pass off the responsibility on to the sunday school teacher and suppose of course if they send their children to sunday school they do the best they can for them now i am satisfied from my experience as a sunday school teacher that the best religious instruction imparted abroad still stands in need of the cooperation of a systematic plan of religious discipline and instruction at home for after all god gives a power to the efforts of a parent that can never be transferred to other hands but do you suppose said i that the common class of minds with ordinary advantages can do what you have done i think in most cases they could if they begin right but when both parents and children have formed habits it is more difficult to change than to begin right at first however i think all might accomplish a great deal if they would give time money and effort towards it it is because the object is regarded of so little value compared with other things of a worldly nature that so little is done my friend was here interrupted by the entrance of mrs fletcher with the children mrs fletcher sat down to the piano and the sabbath was closed with the happy songs of the little ones 
nor could i notice a single anxious eye turning to the window to see if the sun was not almost down the tender and softened expression of each countenance bore witness to the subduing power of those instructions which had hallowed the last hour and their sweet bird-like voices harmonized well with the beautiful words how sweet the light of sabbath eve how soft the sunbeam lingering there those holy hours this low earth leave and rise on wings of faith and prayer End of chapter eight 